a pretty big chapter out of the psychiatry's page where he's dead. And let's work with you to figure out what in your environment is bothering you. What has caused this to become your normal pattern of emotional behavior? Because all mental health is emotional health, right? And that's something that is not said in pop psychology because pop psychology is funded by pharma. Mm -hmm. That's why when you go out into nature and you spend an hour out there, you feel like you've been turned off, mm -hmm. right? Welcome to Mamwa. I'm Gordy Camp, your host, and this is the podcast that includes you into my most famous song lyrics. He's a middle-aged man with an attitude, and he didn't even have one till he met you. That's right, I'm the middle-aged man, and my attitude will chatter us through all things that I'm passionate about. From spirituality, the gym and fitness, food, traveling, and music or movies. Quick disclaimer, this list is not exhaustive. So you can get on or you can get off and join us for the episodes that you like the sounds of. Dip in or dip out, as long as you keep dipping. Either way, we've got something to say and we're going in three, two... One thing that worries so many of us, but can also become the one thing that we don't even know what we're doing and we're crippling ourselves. Self-sabotage. Welcome to the podcast today. I am your host, Gordy Camp. And as part of our culture and well-being discussions on Mama, our guest today is going to give us his professional insights into the world of self-sabotage. A coach, a mentor, we can discuss issues related to the evolution of human consciousness. Um, so welcome, Jahan Sator, to the show. Thank you for joining us, Jahan. How are you? Hey, thanks for having me. I'm doing well. What's Good. Going on there? Amazing. So um, I'm really excited to get started. Um, so just from my my current knowledge, self-sabotage actually does a lot to undermine our success, let's say, despite our own wishes, our dreams, our values. And I know that from my own experience, it can stem from things like low self-esteem, negative self-talk, um, negative emotions. And these, as we kind of go through life, these are continually reinforced by failure, which I know in my experience it was. Um, and that's from self-sabotage itself. So it's a horrible, vicious cycle. Um, I have been through some of it myself. Um, so can you maybe start by telling us a bit about what you do with self-sabotage and then give us an idea of how, what, how we can identify it in the first place? Okay. So let me hijack the entire show right now. Again. Okay, go. <laughs> so it, to talk about self-sabotage, we have to address the question, what actually is it? So self-sabotage is any collection of thoughts, beliefs, emotions, behaviors, or actions which inhibit your progress in any area of life. So that includes your success, your health, your wealth, your joy, abundance, your spiritual growth, everything. Self-sabotage is carried out by your subconscious programming, which it manifests as patterns of thinking and behaving, which are just living below your conscious awareness. So self-sabotage gives the results, procrastination, people pleasing, self-doubt, fear of failure, fear of success, negative self-talk, addiction, perfectionism, uh, avoidance of emotional self-regulation, financial instability, avoidance of yourself, spiritual bankruptcy, poor relationships, victimhood, ill health, and like you were saying, poor self-esteem. So I guess the problem is that it's a, a lot more physically, emotionally, and spiritually taxing for people to kind of maintain and operate from these self-sabotaging beliefs than it is to change them. Okay and harder for them to become free of self-sabotage. And so most people are gonna to continue to undermine themselves every chance they get, even though they know that they're doing it or they know that something's not right. But I think we also get conditioned in society to just keep on going and, and we don't really self-assess as much as we should. So we only know something's wrong, but we don't know what to do about it. So we're just hoping it will change in time, you know? And often, more often than not, that's not the case. It yeah. So, so, just before we kind of talk about the physical side of self-sabotage then, you mentioned spiritual bankruptcy. 
Can you just tell us a bit more about that aspect before we move into the, the physical realm? Spiritual bankruptcy is just when someone lacks values and morals and ethics and all those kinds of things. Yeah. And that also comes from being traumatized. Honestly, it comes from being conditioned and being traumatized. And when you have your spirit beaten out of you by life circumstances, or, you know, some people are physically abused. A lot of my clients are, you know, domestic abuse survivors, or they've been raped, or some have been human trafficked. Wow. And they've been through terrible things. I mean, there's a lot of dark stuff going on out there. So um, spiritual bankruptcy can also come from your choices. Like you can decide to follow trends and follow the herd and parade around naked in public thinking that, you know, makes you look quote unquote sexy or something. If you're, you know, both, both men and women do it now. Well, you know, primarily you see it women before. Um, anything where you allow your sexuality to be exploited is going to result in spiritual bankruptcy because that's a deep personal part of you. That's, that's your spirit that gets violated. So a lot of people do that as well, but it's just all about the choices that you make. If you are on drugs and alcohol, you are dipping from your well of spiritual wealth, right? Okay, and yeah. you can only spend so much of it before you become empty and hollow. And there's so many people out there that come to me, and there's so many people I see in society. And you can tell that there's you know there's no lights on anymore. They've just buried the best parts of themselves and subtracted away their spirit until they're just like walking around like zombies and stuff. You know, stuff, stuff. Yeah, that makes so much sense. Um, I've heard about. There was two main types of self-sabotage that I want to cover, really. Um, I've heard of passive and active self-sabotage. How would, how do both of those affect us all differently if we're in that process? I don't really define it in those terms. Okay. I can tell you why. Um, it's very simple. Most people know exactly what the problem is. As soon as they start talking they begin to speak their beliefs about themselves and about the world out. And they're, they're telling you what they think. And, and like I said before, they have an inkling that something is going on, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, according to cognitive neuroscience, the conscious mind is just doing about 1% to 5% of your daily actions. And you think that you're thinking when really you're just playing out subconscious programming. So I define programming as something different from conditioning. Conditioning is usually something in the environment that's repetitive. You know, like your parents or what's in the community or what's on the television or the radio or even whatever the culture is, right? Whatever your culture says to do, that's what you do. That's conditioning. Yeah, okay. Or you live in a, a, a narcissistic relationship and narcissists have a way of conditioning you. Abusive people tend to condition you. They unconsciously do those things to get you to behave in a particular way, right? Yeah. But programming is linguistic. Programming is all about the language you use inside your head. So to explain to people how that works, 95% to 99% of your day is all subconscious programming. All those thoughts you're thinking are being followed by actions. So to explain it the best way is that think of a subconscious program as a statement. Let's say I am enough is a statement. Now in your mind, that's a yes or a no. Mm -hmm. You can do an affirmation, but if your subconscious has learned that it's a no, every time you say I am enough in front of your mirror, your subconscious mind is going to follow that with a silent no, because that's not what's in there. So there's really only <laughs> passive self-sabotage, essentially, because depending on how consciously aware you are, 95 to 99% of your day is coming from that program. Yeah. And it's like a cereal box. Imagine every piece of Captain Crunch is a thought related to a linguistic statement, like, I am enough. I am enough because this, or she'll never like me because I am not enough because this thing. And it just goes on and on and on and on. These thoughts that you have are 
running all day long. Remember, you have like up to a hundred thousand thoughts per day, depending on how stressed you are. You know, mm, yeah, yeah. And the other ones that you you don't know are happening under the surface are also playing a very dominant role in your life, right? So the subconscious is just that hard <clears throat> almost that is allowing these programs to be triggered by any stress on your limbic system. And the limbic system is working all the time. In the world that we live in now, it's overactive. That's why when you go into nature and you spend an hour out there, you feel like you've been turned off, mm -hmm. right? So um, does that answer the question? It does, yeah. It does. Um, uh, and then just to carry on with something you were saying about um, the limbic system and the brain always working in a certain way, um, I really just wanted to talk about the mental illness side of that then because, I mean, for me, as somebody with BPD, any of the listeners, if you haven't heard of that, borderline personality disorder, uh, and it's also known as emotionally unstable personality disorder, and that can play havoc with the way your brain is working. So for me, I know firsthand how self-sabotage can affect and continues to affect me in life. Um, so when it comes to things like your brain working in a certain way because of personality disorders, how, what's your ideas on how we can stop self-sabotaging ourselves as a result of that? Just based on my personal experiences working with people with, who have had and shifted the label of bipolar, and that part's very important because it, once you shift the label, you take your power back. Yeah. Because it, it's like walking around, you know, we have labels, I am a man, I can't change that. No matter what I do to my body, I can't change that. I was still born in that container, right? I was still born in that box. So if you're going along fine and you know something's wrong, you go to the doctor and they give you a label. We have up to 400 cognitive distortions that they're aware of. And one of them actually is a linguistic statement. Again, there's something wrong with me. So once someone gets handed a label like you generalize anxiety disorder or bipolar disorder or anything like that, it answers that cognitive distortion. Mm -hmm. And the cognitive Version is just a mental filter that we process information through. So we begin to live our lives through that filter of, I have this disorder. And so the word disorder in itself implies chaos, it implies something's wrong. And so we continue to subconsciously live that role out. So usually what we do is we try to get the person, the client, to stop living life through that label. Begin to see yourself as a normal individual who has issues just like everybody else. The world is not against you. Your brain is not turning against you on purpose. It's just an issue with the limbic system. And so that's where we take a, a pretty big chapter out of the psychiatry's page, well, old school psychiatry, not that here's a pill for that type of psychiatry. It's the let's work with you to figure out what in your environment is bothering you. What has caused this to become your normal pattern of emotional behavior? because all mental health is emotional health, right? And that's something that is not said in pop psychology because pop psychology is funded by pharma. Mm -hmm. But those who work, you know, there's billions of therapists out there who work with people all the time that understand this is just an emotional issue. Yeah. And it's a hardware issue. So the first thing you want to do is you look at somebody's diet. You look at what they're putting in because programming is, again, triggered by stress on the limbic system. And it could be anything. It could be something in the external world or it could be an environmental toxin. It could be chemicals in food. It could be something as simple as sugar. It could be caffeine. And if you don't drink coffee or tea but you eat chocolate, it could be in the chocolate because caffeine is one of these things that isn't regulated, so it doesn't have to be listed on the label. Yeah, okay. And it's only sugar as well. And we have all these different names for MSG, including artificial and natural flavors. When you see that on a package, stay away from it. So when we work with people who have um, anxiety and bipolar and these things, we take away things from their diet. It's incredible how much more control they have over their ability to self-regulate. 
And so they just begin to rewire and get control over it, right? So I've worked with about five people in the past two years who have come to me and said that literally going to their regular therapist hasn't done anything. They just want to talk about things that don't even matter to the problem that they're having. Yeah. And they want to, you know, deal with the problem. They want to get off of medication that makes them feel terrible. All these kinds of things. So we have to just look at what you're putting in. If you're putting in, you're listening to aggressive music or songs with heavy emotional content or watching too much TV or looking at screens, like mobile phone screens, I call them death rectangles because we've all just been a part of a massive experiment where they're only now beginning to talk about the detrimental effects of screens on the brain. And so just about everybody from oh, what, four or five different generations or more grew up with a television present. Yeah. We're only now learning what that technology actually does. And so the limbic system is going crazy. You can't make decisions. It gets to that point where, you know, you think people are talking badly about you when you enter a room or whatever, <laughs> you know, or you have a small issue with someone and in your mind, you don't know how to self-regulate and it seems like a big thing to you. Take a look at what you're doing. Yeah. Take a look at all your actions. Take stock of your whole life and try to figure out what's going on because the subconscious is just trying to keep you safe. So it might be manifesting in behaviors where you push people away or you get angry or you can't control yourself. And that's all it is. It's just a stress. And you're naturally doing what you're supposed to do to avoid problems. <laughs> and you end up creating more, right? It's yeah. So thinking about what you were saying about um, the results of people, I'll use air quotes for the listeners, hiding behind like mental disorders when they've been diagnosed and feeling like that's the reason for the sabotage when in actual fact if i'm hearing you right you're saying mm -hmm. it it's the trauma that happened previously that's created that not the disorder itself yeah it's it's the event that happened that you never processed yeah the reason I, I, i'm moving forward with that is um i i was diagnosed with my disorder at the age of 40 and I'd been self-sabotaging <laughs> from the age of 16. So I didn't even know I had a problem mentally until then. Um, right. But it, by that point, I'd already started working on myself and working on my anxieties, working on the way I was treating myself in life. So I'd kind of got over a lot of hurdles by then anyway. So mm -hmm. being told about that didn't affect me the way it would do if a doctor told me that, like 20 years before. Um so I completely get that. Um, so you're talking about the way we are with other people then. And when it comes to relationships, like let's get into that. So there's so many of us in, in the world, but some of these guys listening, who probably end really good relationships out of what you mentioned earlier, fear of rejection, fear of failure, or like we're the ones who maybe are screwing it up anyway because we think that's going to end anyway. I may as well ruin it now. Um, so how, again, how, how do we take hold of that behavior? What do we need to think about to get over that and stop it happening? It begins by being brutally honest with yourself because human beings have this thing where they enjoy living in lies. They really love it. And, you know, I'm, I'm talking like I'm not human, but I am too. And, you know, even to this day, sometimes I still have thoughts or almost do things that are self-sabotaging. And it's, yeah, that's how insidious it is because some things will always tempt you and some things will come back around. But if you are honest when it happens and you say, hold on, what am I really thinking here? Even if you have to stop and write it down on a piece of paper and be like, this doesn't make any damn sense. <laughs> you know, like, why would I say this to this other person? What really is going on? I usually teach people to think in a very simple way. If you have a thought about something, question it immediately and say one question. For what purpose do I think this thing? And your mind is going to answer you. Yeah. 
because the subconscious is waiting all day long to have a conversation with you. The subconscious is just like an annoying secretary and it's asking you, is it okay to keep this? And you have the choice whether you want to say yes or no, right? But if you don't answer it, it just goes back into storage and it continues to repeat. So we get conditioned to ignore our emotions, especially as men. We get conditioned to never address things, right? And so that's a bad pattern that we all get into, men or women. You can't do anything about it because we have so many emotions throughout the day and many of them are fleeting, but we don't pay attention to any of it. The key is to feel everything, question everything. So if you get an answer to for what purpose am I thinking this, then you question the answer to that too. Okay, so I'm thinking that she doesn't like me because maybe my hair doesn't look good today. For what purpose? And you will begin to find the roots of any beliefs or anything in that example that lead back to poor self-esteem. Or maybe when you were 12, somebody said, your hair made you look like a shithead and you internalized that. And that became the default pattern of thinking for you, you know, constantly having to watch around and care about what people think about you. So you're afraid to express yourself. It could be so many different things or you could just have an event from your childhood. I, I use this example because this is a real example. This little kid, when he fell in love for the first time, he went to the store, he bought a chocolate for his crush. He tried to get it to her at school the next day and she ran away. Now the little girl ran away because she was scared too. She had a crush on the boy too, but she never expected that. It's the first time having a crush. So imagine this little nine-year-old kid is like, what just happened? for the rest of his life and that impacted his relationships yeah. for the rest of his life right so um and it's the things that you don't know and that's our biggest problem we don't know what we don't know yeah so i think at this point i know we've spoke a lot about what self-sabotage is what it may have come from i think maybe now if you don't mind let's have a chat about what form self-sabotage might take because there may be some people listening thinking i don't know if i've ever had self-sabotage how would i know if i've if i'm self-sabotaging you wouldn't (laughs) so like what might what tasks or what events might people be putting themselves through to highlight their own self-sabotage i usually focus on health and nutrition choices people will go out drinking on the weekends thinking that they're having fun and celebrating something when that's not really what's going on you would know as as a person from the uk the culture is very much go down to the pub and have a pint literally and that's a conditioned self-sabotage response when we drink coffee and stuff we're self-sabotaging because it creates more stress in the body actually borrows energy from tomorrow so we end up feeling like we're 100 years old by the time we're 40 or 50, and we don't know why. We've been like long coffee drinkers. But it affects the brain as well. Caffeine turns off the brain. If you look at brain scans, you will actually see after 10 minutes of drinking a cup of coffee, the energy in the brain starts off like this without the caffeine, and then it goes right down to the center and disappears. So it's one very small little blue dot happening and so when you drink a cup of coffee and you're like ah i feel relaxed i can do what i want to do now no you can't you're just actively going along because you can you're on autopilot yeah but your brain is being um destroyed and you're creating uh adrenal corticotrophic hormone in the body which is not good at all it's destroying your your brain and your body little by little and that's when people get adrenal fatigue and all these different things, burnout, all these different things. Um, like I said, alcohol, sugar, you just punch in your liver over and over. You know, if you consume sugar every day, you got to take a break in between. But those things are also affecting your limbic system, mm-hmm. which is affecting your ability to make decisions. I know people who've ended relationships because they're subconsciously doing what Ross Geller did in Friends, you know. Um, things like that you you never know what's going to happen 
So it's all about the choices that you make. Society tends to tell us that all these things that are bad for us are really fun. And they come up with all these studies and stuff that show that all these things are good for us. But that's because the people who sell those things pay for those studies so that we yeah. use those things, right? So it's, we have to become aware that the world is not a nice place and that we are in control of what we put in our bodies and what we think about ourselves and about other people. And you have to come to a point of peace in knowing that <laughs> the entire world is, is, is basically a trauma-based world and it's, it's hard. Being alive is hard. Yeah. And if you can't get control of your thinking, you are just going to drown. Yeah. We're a very consumer-based planet. And yeah. if you're not careful, you will consume from start to finish of your life. Because without being getting into conspiracy theories, can, can, corporations know how to make us consume. They just, they know. They have scientists, like you say, like who know how our brains work better than we do. And that's mental. That's literally, it blows my mind because... Without even knowing it, I could be doing something every single day, knowing without realizing that somebody else has prompted that. It just yeah. it blows my mind every time I think about it. So, <laughs> yeah, it, it's crazy. Like the people in the music industry that are at the top that say sing about this topic or that topic, they don't even enjoy music. They probably listen to classical music or nothing at all. They're just businessmen. Yeah, they just want millions of dollars off of you buying some records so they don't care and the people in the labs they know exactly what they're doing because they're engineering all the chemicals to be addictive yeah in everything right you know they're genetically modifying things because they know that it's quick business you know, they, you know nobody has time for apple to grow anymore you know it's, it's everything is right now yeah. right so they're really just targeting these three pathways of the brain that work together that pretty much perceive sorry it dictates how we perceive ourselves other people how we interpret our emotions and all the, the thoughts and behaviors that we have just pretty much are as a result of those things so if you don't understand history like i said i don't want to get into conspiracy theories because i don't i don't do conspiracy theories i, I just talk about what's really going on out there yeah because that's the only thing that matters. I'm sorry for all the people who are into conspiracy theories and they're worried about aliens and all that kind of stuff. Like none of that has anything to do with your everyday uh, living. Like you know, like you, you would know if you're struggling with a diagnosis or something. That's the center of your world. You don't have time for aliens. You know, yeah. all that. <laughs> and the aliens don't even want to come here because we act too crazy. <laughs> That's the point. You know? They already so, know we're crazy before they get here. <laughs> exactly. So you know, what does it matter anyway? Like, life is not going to stop because of all those things that conspiracy theorists talk about. But anyway, there's these pathways, and it's all beginning at the prefrontal cortex, which is wisdom, rationality, and all those good things, you know? People who are addicted, their pathway is being targeted as well. So I'm trying to condense all this information in my brain into a very small package to tell you quickly. Yeah. It's like one reward pathway that we have is dopamine based. So dopamine is communicating back and forth between something called the ventral pigmental area. And it has these dopamine receptors that are located in the, the nucleus accumbens, which are basically the things that manufacture your feelings of motivation and give you that sense of reward. And even when you learn something and you feel good, that's what that is. So yeah. You're, you're so good. if I'm right, dopamine is also known as the happiness hormone, isn't it? It's known as the happiness hormone, but it, you know, again, that's kind of like pop psychology distracting you from what it actually okay. does, which is many things. All the neurotransmitters do many different things other than just the one thing that we always talk about, you know, because you always hear about dopamine and serotonin, but they do so much more. Yeah. Neurotransmitters are communication devices, right? And without them, we'd be screwed. So, like, dopamine, that pathway I just described to you, you know, the going to the, the 
the ventral tegmental area and the nucleus accumbens and things like that. That's how you learn what feels good. Okay. But when you consume an Oreo cookie, you learn that sugar feels good. And you learn that all the other chemicals in it feel good momentarily. But then you crash, right? And so the same thing happens with alcohol. You think it feels good, then you crash. Caffeine, you think it feels good, then you crash. Masturbation, you think it feels good, then you crash. You can only do that for so long. You know, shopping, you go out, you spend all your money, you feel good, then you crash. And that's because um, you have these clusters of neurons that are basically having the same effect on your brain as heroin or morphine when you experience that. So that's why you get pleasure or bliss from certain things. But is, it can be hard to then have that same experience, you know? Yeah. Is there a way to manufacture that feel-good neurological response without consuming and that becoming addicted to these products or things. Yeah, learn to like yourself. Meditate. Yeah. Go into nature. Get some pets. Cultivate good relationships with people. Um, any any serious relationship between you and a good friend or a sibling or a parent or a partner is the best way to get the right neurotransmitters going you know yeah. it's not always going to be happy things because you have to think and then you have to have emotions about things but when you resolve those things you rewire the brain and you get stronger and you become resilient and you notice more good things and you know to avoid the things that are going to cause problems right um eat clean eat simple whole foods prepare your own meals a lot of people say they don't like cooking or they don't know how to cook. It's usually because they haven't tried. Yeah. It's usually because when those insidious chemicals from packaged food get into your body, it, it distorts your thinking. And so all of your thinking is trying to direct you back to getting more of that. And you just don't want to have to spend 20 minutes boiling a potato, for example, right? Yeah. You just you need those chemicals. That's the only thing that's happening under the surface. So everything else that seems logical to you that you use to self-justify eating the chemical foods or whatever, even if it's just like a piece of fried chicken, that becomes your, your pattern of thinking that overrides all real logic. Yeah. Right? So you got to be aware of those kinds of things. Cause yeah. And there's even a lot of help healthy foods that aren't even healthy because we think we're being healthier by choosing rice, vegetables, fruits. But even then, unless they're organic, and I genuinely don't even know if organic food is just is healthier because of pesticides and chemicals to make them grow faster and bleach, breads, wheat. It's all bleached, bleached chemicals to make them white. Uh, they don't grow white, but they're bleached before they get to you to make them look better. It's just, it's a yeah, minefield. Look into that, like everything has been manipulated in one way or another. So yeah. I think we tell people rather than worry incessantly about all those different details, start where you can with what you have. Exactly. Until yeah. you can find better and then keep moving on until you can get pretty much as good as you can get you know like yeah we'll talk about this in the travel section but where i come from we still get pure sugar actually the, the sugar um factories have been privatized and they've made it so that there can't be any manipulation of the sugar right that's it's amazing pure brown sugar, right um whereas in other parts of the world they add lime and other chemicals to it and once that's done to it then it becomes more like cocaine than anything else right <laughs> so um once you refine that sugar it becomes crack essentially so i don't think everybody will have access to those things but if you talk to older folks like somebody that's 80 90 years old you learn a lot about the way that the world was <laughs> in those times when yeah. they were growing up and they didn't have all these environmental pollutants and chemicals and everything and they didn't even eat as much meat or anything as, as we do, but that's, again, the meat industry, the dairy industry. Everything's meat and cheese all day long. you got to eat eggs, meat, and cheese all day long, right? But those things 
put stress on the body, which then puts, it, puts stress on your brain, and you're back into self-sabotage mode, right? Yeah. So nobody's eating a really full balanced diet. Look at what they do. Like they pit us against each other, the vegans versus the carnivores. And then there's a very small subsection of people who just eat clean whole foods <laughs> that came from good sources. And the, I fall in that category. And I'm just looking at everybody like, why are you, you arguing? Like none of that existed 30 years ago. Why are you arguing about eating all meat or eating all vegetables you know both of them their teeth are falling out both of them they're having <laughs> severe health issues both of them are vitamin b deficient all the things that they're arguing between each other about they're all having the same problems because they're just not eating whole clean balanced diets yeah right and that it's the same thing everything's political in that way you know? all you can do is worry about yourself and worry about what you put in your body don't care about what anybody else puts in their body. You can tell people, but you can't hand wisdom over to people. They have to learn on their own, right? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I think we're all on the same journey, but you just can't tell anybody anything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? So, I mean, I've got a good story coming up anyway about um, self-sabotage because I wanted to then take this opportunity to move into like success and work. We spoke a lot about relationships and like just going through generic life. Um, but when it comes to success, our work and career is, well, that's the main thing that brings us the lifestyle we want, the money, the the ha- happiness and fulfillment, like as a result of what we get from work. Um, and that's a journey in itself. So the story I'm just going to tell about self-sabotage is when I was 19, I was, I was a, a manager of a news agent, and they brought in a new policy where we had to wear a shirt and tie. And I, as the manager, I was like, I haven't worn a shirt and tie for my whole time working for this company, and I'm not going to start now. Wearing a shirt and tie does not change how I how I'm capable I am to put some sweets on a shelf and put numbers into a till. Um, and I went through a whole scenario of. Um, disciplinary meetings I got moved to a different store Um, my whole life got uprooted just because I didn't agree with a a policy I don't know if it's because I was young and 19 or if that was self-sabotage but the person I am now is so different to that young stupid boy but that was just for me that was self-sabotage because I wasn't happy in my job and subconsciously that was me saying how can I be I don't want to do this anymore? How can I screw this up? Yeah, how can I screw this up? How can I change my current yeah. situation? Um, we tend to reject <laughs> things that don't fulfill us. It doesn't yeah. matter how old you are. I mean, a lot of your um, attitude could have been just being a teenager, but I definitely think subconsciously because you didn't want to do it, you began to look for a way to get out of that. Yeah. That's what we do, though. Like, we, you know, that's why people feel like, they get up in the morning and they just feel so drained that they have to reach for that cup of coffee or, you know, they have to reach for the alcohol on the weekends and Friday through Saturday, they're drinking because they don't like it. They don't like what they have to do to survive. Right. Yeah. So we, we just want to find ways out of it. So we're prepared to poison ourselves just to get out of something. We're prepared to poison ourselves with toxic emotions towards somebody in a relationship because we don't want to be honest with them in, in the moment. We're prepared to behave like a jackass at work because we don't want to put on a tie, right? Yeah. Like all these different things. Well, we can just get another job. We just have an honest conversation. Just make a different choice. Yeah. Well, that's what we do. We 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 have a bad habit of self justifying things and making a lot of shit up in our heads. That's what we do. Yeah, I, I hear it all the time. Every day of the week, except for Saturday to Sunday, I hear it all the time. Yeah. <laughs> And I always wonder, like, going from our conversation now as well, isn't there an easier way to feel happier at work if we're not enjoying it until we find something better? How can we, without, again, consuming stuff to make us feel better, what's the best way to find joy in what we have to do until something else comes along? You you don't have a choice. You have to and put pen to paper and figure out what are the pros and the cons. What do I get out of this? 
what is my why? What is my reason mm -hmm. for doing this? And usually you'll find out that there's a lot of reasons why you're doing what you're doing. And there's a lot of reasons why you shouldn't be doing what you're doing. You have to, you just have to make a choice. I will never ever tell somebody to quit your job just because you don't make it. <coughs> that's something that's very dangerous out there in the personal development world and like the coaching industry and stuff. It's like you just quit working, you know, the Rockefeller said this and you know, we're just slaves and yeah, but we need street sweepers. Yeah. We need people in cubicles that do menial jobs, otherwise the world's gonna stop turning without the people who do that work. Yeah. I don't think we're ever gonna get to that point where we can go without the the menial jobs and, and stuff like that, the boring jobs. We have to have people who can be good workers because that's just the way the world is built. So you have to find joy at your work. You have to find your reason for doing it because you can always funnel small amounts of energy into the things that you really love doing outside of the time that you're working. Mm -hmm. Most people have been conditioned to be afraid of embracing creativity, right? That's what keeps people stuck. Yeah. And I think also the a lot of the why is the the lifestyle you get from working. Like it's not always about the job itself. It's about because I do this job, I'm working towards the life that I can I can honestly be happy about. Mm -hmm. And like have that genuine fulfillment in your life. Um Yeah, money and, gives you the freedom to walk away from situations. Yeah. <laughs> don't like you know and you just unfortunately it doesn't grow on trees so you have to go and do things that you don't like doing I mean, yeah i'll be completely honest with you i love doing this job but i also don't always enjoy the long hours and the different time zones and stuff sometimes you're awake at midnight going mm -hmm. on one two three in the morning because somebody else is in thailand or some crazy shit like that and you, you just you get tired of it because you're you're sleepy the next day and you still have a life to live but i look at my bank account and i think okay well this is my job this is what i've chosen to do i have the choice to do something else but would it be any better so why not do something that fulfills me yeah because there's a lot of stuff that i could be doing that doesn't fulfill me exactly and there's a job for everyone there mm -hmm. is literally you talk about menial jobs but even those jobs are somebody's fulfillment. Yeah, they, they would yeah. love to do that. The pleasure they would take from that isn't the same as maybe the next person, but there is a job for absolutely everyone. Um, so then that brings me to procrastination then. You mentioned this at the start. Procrastination, like I, until today, thought it was an avoidance tactic. Um, but from what you said, it's obviously a, a symptom of how we sabotage ourselves, right? So how it's a safety issue. Yeah. It, it, doing something that you don't ordinarily do or that you don't want to do, it's difficult because it's a change from what makes you feel safe. And for a lot of people, it's easy to just sit around and scroll on social media or sit around and put on an album and listen to it or turn on a TV or go do something apart from what you should be doing. If you ever seen somebody that, you know, they're supposed to go to the supermarket or something, they just don't want to leave home, so they find everything else to do besides that. It's simple stuff. That's it me. Is Hi. <laughs> yeah, it is evasion, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You just have to be honest with yourself about the reasons why you don't want to do it and then realize you probably should do it anyway and do it. Yeah. And, and there's just a lot of stuff in like self-sabotage coaching that is just ridiculous where you feel like you're a parent to someone and you have to tell them to get off your ass and do it you know like there was a lady that she had to change her diet to get surgery some kind of a bariatric surgery and she didn't want to change her diet and she was like well what are the things that i need to do to um uh, drop all of this weight really quickly and it's like you gotta eat this and eat that and one of the things that she was supposed to eat was like pineapple and stuff and she's like i don't like pineapple when i was a kid this thing happened and i threw up because i ate the pineapple 
and all this kinds of stuff. And we went back and forth on it. She was really just arguing. I eventually just said to her, listen, eat the goddamn pineapple or just we have to stop. You. I'm not going to deal with you anymore because you don't want to do something as ridiculous as not eat pineapple. Yeah. Which you know you need to. And she was like, oh, well, nobody ever talked to me like that before. So I guess I will. You know, like some people just put up resistance for the sake of it. Yeah. Because they made up in their heads that they don't want to do things for whatever reason. And then some people need to be scolded. Some people need to be spanked. <laughs> you know, some yeah, people literally. Really get a slap across the back of your head because you know, they have all these ridiculous reasons that make sense to them. They don't realize that it is only in your thinking that you're stuck. Yeah. And we've had a lot of discussion on this. and Well, you've had a lot of discussion on this on your podcast um, with self-sabotage. So what are the key themes that you hear quite a lot when you're talking about it on your podcast, is there a set three or four that keep coming up on my podcast? Well, my podcast is usually about the things that are more like in the Google realm or like I was saying before, the, the ETs and the entities and all that kinds of stuff. And that plays a role in stuff too. I, I couldn't even tell you. Without spending another three, four hours, I couldn't tell you in one sentence or even one paragraph the kinds of crazy stuff that goes on with people out there. But it's usually just in the podcast, it's usually I talk about the self-sabotaging aspects of cognitive distortions and, um, you know, the television and what that does to your brain and alcohol and I've even talked about how like spiritual forces work against you and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. And that does happen. <laughs> yeah. yeah. People don't realize the extent to which it happens. I think we're all actually at a good point in humanity where people are embracing the paranormal and the supernatural a little more and they're open to talking about things because before it was kind of like, shh, shh, can't talk about that, you know? So yeah. people kept it to themselves, but people get haunted. There's entities and beings and stuff that they just like your energy <coughs> and they find ways to latch onto you and they torment you, they torment your spirit. And I mean, it's even in the Bible and I'm not even a big endorsee of the Bible as it is, you know, because okay. I think it's a, uh, and that's because I was a, a young kid when I found out a lot of stuff about the Bible because they made us study the Reformation and you know, all those things, you know, 15th, 16th century drama okay. surrounding that. So, you know, from a very early age, I realized that it was a collection of books that were manipulated by men, by kings, to be used as a control mechanism, right? So I'm not saying to anybody, don't read your Bible or whatever. Do what, do, do what you want to do, but just be aware that the information in it, there's a lot of truth in it, but there's also a lot of stuff that's left out. And there's a lot of things that are sugar-coated and... and believe it or not, they're kept under wraps so that you don't really understand the true things about it. And there's a, a character called Marcion that I studied about in history as a kid. And Marcion said that the God of the Bible was Satan, was a satanic entity just because of all of the anger and, you know, the killing and stuff that happened. And um, he was a controversial figure back then. So that's why... I kind of tell people you got to learn to think for yourself. And yeah. no matter what you do, what your religion or what your faith is, try to see the reality of the world for the way that it is and not what's dictated to you by some middleman mm. trying to tell you how to think, you know? And it's it's a lot of crazy stuff that goes on out there. And people will live their lives for anything up to an entire lifetime, thinking the way somebody else thinks rather than thinking what they think and questioning that and testing it against reality and stuff like that. So I've been a, a great resistor <laughs> of common knowledge for a long time. I think that is what's helped me. I'm starting to get away from the topic that you were on. No, it's fine. Talking about seeing the world then, where are you from? Tell our listeners yeah, where I'm you're from. Born in Barbados. Amazing. And what's Barbados like? 
It's always hot and always sunny, except for hurricane season, which is right now where it's gloomy and rainy. Okay. But it's still hot. <laughs> I imagine it's quite yeah, scary just, when you get hurricane season, is it? Yeah, we just got through a uh, barrel that passed by. So it, we, it's just basically slapped us, and it's a good thing because it was devastating for a lot of people. And didn't yeah. Hit. Fab, so if anyone's going to Barbados, what should they look for for an authentic experience? Get yourself a rental vehicle and drive around the island and go talk to people and sample the fresh fruits and sample the sugarcane products and just enjoy the beaches. Excellent. And what's the authentic dish or drink and drink? Let's go a dish and drink. What's the most authentic foods and drinks they could try while they're there? Authentic foods and drinks. Um, we have something called cuckoo, which is made from cornmeal and okra and some spices. Oh, wow. And it's like a, it kind of looks like mashed potatoes. It's usually served with flying fish in a kind of a gravy, or it's fried flying fish. Um, I don't eat it because I don't eat fish. <laughs> I don't eat corn. But it's pretty delicious. When I used to eat it when I was younger, it was delicious. And also some things have come into the culture like macaroni pie and barbecue chicken. And you can go to lots of fish fries and things like that if you're into that. Um, and to drink, we are famous for rum. So there's plenty of distilleries around. We have... I'm actually smack dab in the middle of two of them. There's Monk Game Rum and Staves Rum. Okay. And you like go to these places and hang out and sample products. And it's not all alcoholic stuff either. But uh, um, it's pretty, yeah, it's, it makes for a pretty good time if you're into that. Amazing. Well, you heard it here first. Get yourself to Barbados. Try all the nice things. Yeah, it's a good place to come to. I mean, if you're from the UK, that's where the majority of our traffic comes from because people just get tired of the doom and gloom in the sky all the yeah. time. You know, some people just want sun and warmth, you know? And um, we have some of the best beaches that you could ever ask for. The sand is unbelievably clean and white. The sea is always low and inviting, you know? On a lot of our coasts, I guess on the West Coast, the reefs and stuff have receded. They've been covered over because they died off and like the sand was covered in this way. So you just walk straight into the water. You don't have to worry about anything nipping you on your feet or anything like that, you know? You don't get sharks. We have a lot of sharks, but they stay to like the East Coast and stuff like that. Okay. They stay further up because the water is so shallow that they wouldn't be able to survive in that. Good to know. Mm-hmm. I'll have to remember it. Okay, perfect. Okay, so just as we start to wrap up then, what are your tips for our listeners getting themselves out of the bad self-sabotage routines? I'll tell you what one of my mentors told me a long time ago. Notice what you're noticing. So every thought that you have about everything, allow yourself the freedom to notice that without fear of what's going to come next because every emotion that you feel is going to come with thoughts and sometimes it's the sting behind the realizations or just addressing the thoughts or addressing even the images that come to you that stop you from pursuing something that is stealing from your joy so what does that mean then like when you once you've noticed it what what's the action to make sure you're going in the right direction with that well, thought. it depends because we, we're typically dominantly visually auditory or kinesthetic. Okay. So some people like me, I'm dominantly auditory, so I hear things. I, my thoughts are like somebody talking in my head. But some people will have visuals. Most people actually are more visual than they know. And you'll have images will come through your head. Your, your mind's trying to piece things together based on stuff that you've seen before to send you a signal so you can freeze it i can tell you exactly what to do anytime you have an image freeze it in your head and pretend it's a photograph and you can look at it see what it is you can grab it like this reach out and grab it close your eyes and you can actually pull it and realize it gets bigger 
you can do things with it. Like you can manipulate things, pretend like you're actually holding something and you see it happen in your hand. You can fold it up from each corner, ball it up, throw it away. All these different things you can, you can do in your mind. So I imagine we'd have so to practice that a few times to get used to it. Yeah, yeah. you have to practice it. But it's actually not hard to do because once you realize that when you start to work with uh, images in your head, there's sensations in your body that you feel as well too. Like you find that you store things, certain parts of your body. And there's information in everything, is my point. There's information in whatever you hear. There's information in everything you feel. And all you have to do is say, stop, hold on, bring that back. Let me feel that, assess it, and talk to yourself nicely. <laughs> yeah. You know, getting into this stuff about, oh, you're so stupid and all these different things that people say to themselves, that doesn't solve anything. It's just beating yourself over the head for nothing. Yeah. Right? Fab, I think your podcast has got some really excellent information in there. Um, so if anyone wants to go and find you and your podcast, where should they go? So if you really want to listen to the show, what you can do is go to Spreaker.com and you can log in and you type in Boundless Authenticity Podcast and you'll see a picture of me. It's a black logo and um, you can just start listening. You can, and my email is on at the bottom of that too. Like my personal email is at the bottom. So you can always scroll to the bottom, get that, send me an email. Um, but yeah, just enjoy the show. It's available on Apple. It's available on Spotify as well. But I prefer that people go to Spreaker and listen because you can save. And if you get the app on your phone or something, it'll alert you when a new episode is released and it'll automatically download that. So you don't have to go look for it. Okay. Right? So it's, it, I don't know how it works. It doesn't download it to your phone and take up space on your phone. It just puts it in something called offline mode yeah. automatically. Right? Fab, and do you have a website or anything? Yeah. You can go to my website, selfsabotage.xyz, but I don't really do anything on that. Okay. Yeah. People can just email me directly at selfsabotageinfo at proton.me. Or, like I said, they can go to Spreaker and get my personal email. That's excellent. Thank you. Okay, well, that's great. Thank you so much, Jahan, for taking time out to talk to us today. It's been absolutely great to see you. And I'm sure our listeners have had some great takeaways from today. I know I have. Don't forget, everyone listening, subscribe to the channel to make sure you don't miss an episode. And you can keep the conversation going over on the Facebook page, Gordicamp TV, or on Instagram and threads at Gordicamp. Until next time, look after yourselves and others. Be aware of those vicious cycles and keep on growing. We will see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.